I'll pray and the Lord help me today. Our Father in heaven, I'd like to be soft and gentle and easy, and uh, without you, it's an impossibility. So help us this morning. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Subject this morning is, uh, oh, hold on a second. It's from the beginning. Subject this morning mushrooms? is not, not mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> it's not mushrooms. Okay. So, uh, oh, Lord, help me. What time is it? Don't say 8.20. What time is it? In time. Okay. In, in time. <laughs> time to wake up. I was going to say it's almost time for, it's almost time for the Lord to come. Lord to come. Oh, okay. Isn't it? Mm-hmm. This is what you said. It's what you mm-hmm. said. You know, it's what you said. So, Ms. Barbara, you want to read it since you said that? And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we believe. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's getting close, we say. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, a cardinal rule, well, let me erase that. A foundation principle of health ministry is prevention is... A foundation principle of uh, uh, the end of sin would have been better than the cure. The cost to cure is quite high. Prevention is always better to prevent than the cure, right? So the earlier the treatment, the better. That's it, pretty soon. Uh, who'd like to read? Uh, uh, Brother Sean. Stage four cancer is sometimes referred to as metastasis. 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 I can't say it. Break cancer because it often means the cancer has spread from its origin to distant parts of the body. So they say it's metastasized, right? It's spread from the body. It's a man when he's told, uh, you know, talking to, you know, brother with friend who has prostate cancer. The question is, is it confined to the prostate or has it spread? So the doctor said it has not spread yet. You need to, you know, that kind of talk. So stage four means uh, in most cases you're a goner. You know, mm-hmm. prevention's better. Not all cases. It's something you can do, but it's better to do it in the early stages, right? It's a disease of subject this morning, escalation. It's a disease of escalation. Escalation means what? Longer it goes, worse it gets. So, uh, cancer, this is a nice, uh, Jesus is a specialist in preventive medicine. <laughs> so he tells you what the cause is, so you address it and it prevents the effect, which is the cancer. So, uh, Brother Sean, I'll read this one too. Cancer, tumors, and all inflammatory diseases are largely caused by me. So the option here, and I could have used prostate for me or breast cancer if you're a woman and you're in your late, late 40s, now to mid 50s or something, number one cause of death is breast cancer for you. But we know the longer you wait on breast cancer, prostate cancer, the longer you wait, the more difficult it is, right? It's better because it's a disease of escalation. Get it when it's early, right? When you, if you can. Now, uh, I'll read. Treatment options. <sighs> You know the treatment options. Now, for, for uh, prostate cancer, I, I use prostate cancer. Treatment options. Chemotherapy, proton therapy. I've got a friend right now that had the proton therapy, has had a catheter for now like two months. So don't think proton therapy is a miracle answer. It's not. Or uh, hormone therapy, radiation seating, surgery. And it's, it's, just, it's just like there's no good. And it's the same with breast cancer. There's no good option. There's no good option. Even I'm going natural. Most people that do that die too, if it's advanced. So there's no good option. Treatment options for stage four breast cancer, then you can read about them. Now, the uh, longer you wait, the harder it is. Would you agree, the longer you wait today, cancer of the soul, the longer you wait to address it, the harder it is. Yeah. Let me just give you an example. My mother, my mother, her sister, my aunt was named Selmy. And my mother did not talk to her aunt, her, t- my mother did not talk to her sister, my aunt, for 18 years. After 18 years, is it hard to uh, sew up a wound? Yes. Yeah. The longer you wait, harder it gets. Now, when you think about the context, when this was written, it was written when? A long time ago, right? And Ms. White died in 1915. It had to be written a, a long time ago. Anything she wrote is more than 100 years old. Sister Nicole? The enemy of souls is working in a masterful manner to gain full control of the human mind 
and what God's servants do to warn and prepare men for the day of judgment must, must be, be done, done quickly. quickly. Now, evidently, we did not do it quickly. Kind of? And the result? Metastatic evil. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm just going to go through three or four or five things, and right? It's, it's spread like a cancer. Uh, by the way, I usually don't read the uh, headlines. This morning, the headline, I don't read it. I, you know what the headline was this morning? Last night, anybody looked at it? Mm-hmm. Last night, man walks into a FedEx facility in Indianapolis, shoots eight dead, shot a lot of other people, and shot himself. That is that that will be off the radar by tomorrow. Yep. It will be. It'll be off the radar. And that's, that's saying off the radar, when the flight controller can't off find the, the plane, he said, it's off the radar. That means it's lost. Mm-hmm. Because that kind of story, only eight people die, will make the headlines for one day. Yep. Tomorrow, it will be a new story. Mm-hmm. Uh, metastatic evil. So a few days ago, this was on the uh, Iran shot down the U.S. drone. Now, from the U.S.'s point of view, that's bad news. From Iran's point of view, it's good news. <laughs> it depends on your point of view. Some people look at evil and say that's good. Some look at good and say that's evil. It's high time to awake out of our sleep and look at evil and say what? Cancer is cancer. And the earlier you address it, the better. So this is the U.S. and, uh, of course, is there tension between the U.S. and Iran today? Mm-hmm. Yeah. How do you deal with the escalating crisis? Is there tension to sanctions is what they did. They're putting sanctions on Iran. Is there some tension between the U.S. and China? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What are they threatening? Mm-hmm. Sanctions <laughs> and, and other things, too. Uh, trade embargo. Is there some tension between the U.S. and And now we don't even know. But whatever you, whatever it is, we know there is tension between. Now, now there's a I don't know. But what's the answer? Is it sanctions? No. The answer for cancer is not sanctions. The answer for well, what is it? Is it trade embargo? No. Does the health evangelist have the answer? Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to let uh, one of our brothers in the health evangelism trade give the answer. You can agree or disagree. Brother Ryan, you want to read? Sure. As I walked out the door toward the gate that will lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. Is that a pretty good answer? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I liked it. I heard Nelson Mandela say that, recorded, you know, not in person. And I thought, that's the answer. If we could find, get hold of that kind of thing, is that in the Bible? Well, certainly it is. That's Matthew 6, verse 12. That's what it is. Let, uh, uh, who, who'll read? Who'd like to read? Sister Marie Renee, I know you want to read that. As we forgive those who, who trespass against us. Okay, that's it. So, uh, I'd like to make an argument this morning. That this is... Uh, let me change it. Before, I would, let me erase that. Uh, Lord, help me this morning. Help the mind. Is it possible to forgive even if you can't forget? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Sometimes it's hard to forget, isn't it? Mm-hmm. But it doesn't matter. God still asks you to do what? Forgive. forgive. Yeah. That's thinking big. <laughs> Is God a big thinker? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. God is a big thinker, isn't he? It's uh, Psalms 139, 23. But, but wait a moment before we get there. Councils on Health, uh, Mr. Oliver. My brethren, the, the Lord calls upon you to examine the heart closely. Yeah. Second Chronicles yeah. 16.9. Search me, O God. Psalms 139, 23. Search this heart of mine. Now, on the right, whoever can read that, miss... It's good, but it's hard to read. Uh, who has good? Uh, who can read that? The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. That's good. Very good. So, uh, medical missions, health evangelism. I took this out of uh, uh, where did I get this from? U.S. News and World. I can't remember where I got this. Some uh, someplace research, and this is how they ranked health evangelist. Of course, they didn't use the word health evangelist. 
they used the word engaged in mission service. It was Christians engaged in mission service. But it was uh, health work. So I'm calling them health evangelists. Number one on their list, their uh, priority list was what? That's pretty good, right? Then of course, you know, you're going to Liberia, you know, Ebola, yeah, safety. And then uh, my wife, should I think about my wife a little bit? Gonna haul her off to wherever, Timbuktu? That's a, yeah, and then uh, go where I'm needed, that's good. Be able to practice what I learned, medicine, that's good. Spiritual care, that's good. Frequent furloughs, you need some rest. Chinese medical license, going to China. <laughs> this guy wants to go to China. Insurance and pension. And then last on the list, work hours. Is that pretty good? These are people that filled out surveys that were engaged in health ministry. I'll show you a video of them in a second. Uh, Sister Barbara. The Christian physician should regard his work as exalted as that of the ministry. As exalted as that of the ministry. He bears a double responsibility for him for in him are combined the qualifications of both physician and gospel minister. He is a grand, his is a grand and sacred and very necessary word. Isn't that great? Yeah. My mother, uh, God rest her soul, when she came to Wildwood Hospital, we had the medical convention, and a doctor got up and gave a sermon. And then after the sermon, a preacher got up and talked about health. And my mother said, boy, that doctor really was an informed doctor and that preacher could really preach. I said, mom, the preacher was a doctor and the doctor was a preacher. Yeah. <laughs> Is that the way it should be? Yeah. Yes. And so that little uh, chart of their interest and their focus, this is the folks. As medical director to her hire Dr. Catherine Hodge to solve a problem. The hospital um, approached me and asked me to consider opening a new unit because they recognized that it was just a, a missing piece of the hospital care. They do what they can with the little they have. Babies sleep five or more to a bed. The smallest sleep in makeshift incubators. We designed this box which just has warming light bulbs underneath and since then I don't think we've ever had a hypothermic death. Even during an African summer, underway babies die of hypothermia. Hodge was obviously the perfect person for this two-year journey, but she had to go through an emotional learning curve along the way. A lot of grief, because in the States I had never seen a child die, even once. And then with time, was able to move to this new role of setting up a, a really heartbreaking unit, but one where there's also a lot of hope, because the 33 babies that we have in this ward today would have had no chance. Um, a few years ago, most of them. You know, nursing is a passion. So if people have got that passion to work, I'm looking at how poor people here are. You can stay and you can still go on. So I feel this place is ideal for a Malawian woman. And it's ideal for doctors like Tahar, not for the salary or the luxury or the amenities, but for the necessity. Mm -hmm. The next town is 50 kilometers from here. In an emergency situation, that could be the difference between life and death. George Thomas, CBN News, in Kola Hospital, Malawi. Who'd like to read? Health evangelism works. And that raises the question, who got healed, the doctor or the babies? Both. Okay, well said, I <laughs> know the answer. And then, uh, I don't know about you. This is, I wrote that. I mean, once you've gotten a hold of something like that woman got hold of in Malawi, how could you ever take a position with Sony as vice president? There was a, a friend of a friend. It was a man that knew the man running the mission station off the coast of Africa. Standard Oil came to that man. They liked him because he had, they had interaction with him. You ran the mission station, Seventh day Adventist. And they asked him, because this man's friend was a friend of mine, if he'd worked for Standard Oil. He was an honest guy, he liked him. And so they offered him a position at Standard Oil. And he, he declined it. He said they came back in three months and offered him a higher salary. salary. I may be position too, I don't know. But they raised up the ante and he declined it. And he said three months later they came back 
and uh, they told him, you write your own paycheck. We will pay you, what do we have to pay you to get you to leave here and come work for us? And he told them, the first offer you made me was too much, I'm not worth it. The problem is not your salary, the problem is your job. I work for the king of the universe, you're offering me a job with Standard Oil? It's stepping down. He, that's the problem. You know, isn't that a problem? Your job's too small. Your job's too small. And, you know, today, really, if somebody offered you to be a president of, you fill in the company. Hey, you fill in the company, any company, name anything, right? Uh, Apple, <laughs> Ryan Apple, <laughs> you know, you're going to, uh, isn't that a problem? Because once you've had that kind of thing, the old apple just turned sour, didn't it? It's just the, yeah. Taste and see that the apple is sweet, Psalm 34, 8. So this was the only in the uh, uh, concentration camps the Germans set up. There was only one that had women in it. It's called Ravensbrück. I'm not mispronouncing that. Largest women's concentration camp in Germany. And then I went, I got this out of, out of uh, uh, what you call it, historical things on it. You can find it on the internet. 39 to 45, of course, 40, 1945, America came in, liberated the, everybody, and the war was over. 20, uh, in six, for six years, 130,000 female prisoners passed through the Ravensbrück camp system. If you think it was just all about Jews, you know, no, no, it was a lot broader than just the Jews. 40,000 were Polish, 26,000 were Jewish from all countries, 18,000 Russians, 8,000 French, and 1,000 Dutch. 50,000 perished from disease, starvation, overwork, and despair. Some 2,200 were killed in the gas chambers. Only 15,000 of the total survived until the liberation and American troops, right, April 1945. During the last year of the camp's existence, 80 inmates died each day from disease or famine-related causes. And you may have not have heard about this experiment. They call them the Ravensbrook Rabbits. And, uh, Story of the Ravensbrook Rabbit, a group of 74 young women, uh, these were the prisoners, during World War II. As political prisoners at the concentration camp of Ravensbrook, they were treated as guinea pigs in experiments on the leg. Now this is what I'm going to read, medical work, but it is not medical missionary work, right? Is there a distinction to be made between the two? Yes. Oh yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. uh, they were treated as guinea pigs in experiments on the leg. It gave the, women awful, it gave the women awful scars, disabled extremities, and pain. Yeah, remember something a long time ago, we said health evangelism had been crucified between two thieves. This is one of the thieves, health deform. The experiments began after the death of one of Hitler's close friends. This is why they were cutting their legs open and doing what they did. It began after the death of one of Hitler's close friends, Reinhard Heydrich, whose physician refused to use sulfa drugs when operating on him. The experiments recreated and usually exaggerated the injuries to prove to Hitler that not using sulfa drugs was the correct decision. Now you tell me, what will a man do to justify what he did was right? He'll stop at nothing, anything. And so, uh, you know, even though you can't forget, can you still forgive? Have mercy only by God's grace. This is, uh, you can see what that picture is. See where I got it from? Yeah, the doctor's trials. They took these doctors and after World War II was over, they put those guys on trial. This is out of Wikipedia, right? I think that's where I got this. This is Wikipedia. So I lifted out that paragraph, blew it up so you could read it. The doctor's trial was the first of 12 trials for war crimes of German doctors that the United States authorities held in their occupation zone in Nuremberg, Germany after the end of World War II. 20 of the 23 defendants were medical doctors. Victor Brock, I can't pronounce it, Rudolf Brandt, uh, Wolf, uh, Wolfram Sievers were Nazi officials and were accused of having been involved in uh, Nazi human experimentation and mass murder under the guise of euthanasia. Joseph Mengele, one of the leading Nazi doctors, had evaded capture. This goes back to health reform without love becomes health 
D form. Yeah, it's a, uh, what a mess, huh? Mm -hmm. Sister Nicole, you want to read? Councils on Health. It is not safe to trust to physicians who have not the fear of God before them. Without the influence of divine grace, the hearts of men are deceitful. But, and before you get to it, that word aggrandizement, it means... Exalting. Thank you. Yeah, exalting yourself. Okay, just so we before we get to it, all right. Without the influence of divine grace, the hearts of men are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Jeremiah seventeen nine. Self aggrandizement is their aim. Under cover of the medical profession, what iniquities have been practiced, what delusions supported. Yeah. Yeah. Good to get a doctor. <laughs> it's it's you know what I mean. And, uh, now, if you have a doctor, I had a surgeon. I don't know what his background was, but I was praying, Lord, have mercy on me and help this doctor, All right? So the subject this morning is, now, when you've done somebody wrong and you make it right, that's the Bible doctrine of restitution, right? That's when you've done somebody wrong. Zacchaeus was big on that, right? I've repaid for a fold if I've done anyone wrong. That's restitution. To go to heaven, you got to make restitution. You got to make it right to go to heaven. That's when somebody, when you've done somebody wrong, but when somebody does you, you wrong, do you have something to do? Yes. Yeah, you got to, you got to, uh, yeah. So, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of Corey Ten Boom. Mm -hmm. So, actually, she was from uh, uh, Netherlands. I had seen a documentary on her, I don't know, 20 years ago. I was in Hershey, Pennsylvania, staying with this elderly lady, lady and her little dog. And in the room that I was in, that book, The Hiding Place, was there. And I, I'd, I'd seen a documentary, so I saw it, Corey Ten Boom. I, I kind of knew who she was. And uh, so I picked it up. I'm going to quote from her book two or three times. And ask you what this means. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Somebody tell me what that means in nice, simple language. In spite of how you feel, you can make the decision to forgive. Well said. Right? Just choose. Just choose. Yeah. You may not feel like forgiving. All right? But you still can choose. Sister Renee, you want to read? Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do, do not know what they are doing. Yeah. Now, Jesus was an innocent victim of torture. What he passed through was worse than the Holocaust, right? And this is the kind of man he was. Now, the lady in the middle is Corrie Ten Boom. The one on closest to you, the older one, is her sister, uh, Betsy, I think her name was. They were both in that Ravensbrook camp. But Betsy didn't come out. Corey Ten Boom did. This is God. This is uh, Sister Barbara. This is the Lord. This is not Corey Ten Boom. Mm -hmm. Oh, your feelings, your impressions, your emotions are not to be trusted, for they are not reliable. They're not. <laughs> what do they do? <laughs> All the time, right? All the time. Can't trust them. So this is, uh, yeah, I couldn't find a lot of pictures, but this is where, by the way, in uh, Germany, it gets cold in the winter. You get a cotton jacket and you sleep on a concrete slab or a piece of wood, that's kind of cold, isn't it? This is where they lived, and this is where they died. And other than that, I don't want to show any pictures of that. That's about all I can take. I saw the headline this morning, eight shot dead in uh, FedEx, and I saw it. Because the uh, day before yesterday, was it five shot dead in, three days before that, nine shot dead in, and then at the following up the headlines, the officials always say the same thing. Our hearts go out to the family. That's good, they should. Mm -hmm. Our hearts go out to the families. We will find who is responsible and bring them to justice. It's just like, I remember when I went out of the country in 1996, I was gone one year, came in in 1997. When I went out, CNN that had the case, murder, and this and that, I came back in, the same thing, but the names have changed. I mean, it's the same thing. It's ongoing. And so this is, uh, again, I'll read and ask questions if you don't mind. It was at a church service. This is out of her book. 
Yeah, this is, I took this out of her book. It was at a church service in Munich that I saw him. By the way, when they brought them into the facility, they showered naked. And this is the man that was supervising the operation and one that helped kill her sister. A church service in Munich that I saw him, the former SS man who had stood guard at the shower room door in the processing center at Ravensbrück. He was the first of our actual jailers that I had seen since that time. And so, now, what was her? What was she doing in that church? She was there to do what? Preach? Preach on what? Forgive. Forgiveness, sanctification, justification by faith. That was theory. And when she meets that man, theory just turns into application. He was the first of our actual jailers that I had seen since that time, and suddenly it was all there, the room full of mocking men, the heaps of clothing, Betsy's pain blanched face. He came up to me as the church was emptying, beaming and bowing. I read this in that book, and I thought, yeah, that's got to be a class. That's got to be. How grateful I am for your message, Forlein, he said, to think that as you say, guess what her sermon was on that morning? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Is God good or what? Does God know how to time things out? As you say, he has washed my sins away. <laughs> yes, he's, he's washed your sins, washed in the blood, accepted in Ephesians 1 6, accepted in the beloved. Preach it, sister. His hand was thrust out to shake mine, and I, who had preached so often to the people in Blumendahl, the need to forgive kept my hand at my side. Even as the angry, vengeful thoughts boiled through me, I saw the sin of them. Lord Jesus, I pray, forgive me. And now, is it a sin to have angry, boiling thoughts? Better question. If Jesus had had angry, boiling thoughts, would that have killed the plan of salvation? And we would be lost. One stain on that lamb, and we're all dead men and women. Yeah. It's not just in word. I'm sorry, in deed. It's in word, action, and thought. Isn't that true? Can you sin if you don't say anything? Can a man that looks upon a woman to lust after Matthew 5, 28, did he already commit adultery in his heart? Yes. So you got to remember, this is not just what we say. This is what's in our hearts. Search my heart. I do pretty well sometimes when it comes to the outside. But when the man spit my face over there two times and tried to bite my nose off the third time, outwardly I look cool and collected and calm. Inside my stomach was boiling like a pot. Can the Lord get the church to a place where what the outside and the inside, they can come into sync? Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> is that going to be a miracle? Yes. Come on, it is. I'm human. I'm more human than you are. I'm twice the human than any of you are. Oh, Lord, help me. I, uh, my, even as the angry, vengeful thoughts boil through me, I saw, now the reason I got this out of that book, because she gives the answer in the book, and it's biblical, because when she gives the answer, boom, from the Bible. I said, that's it. I saw the sin of them. Lord Jesus, I pray, forgive me and help me to forgive him. There's first step, right? Lord, have mercy. Help me to forgive this person. I tried to smile. I struggled to raise my hand, but I could not. I, what? Felt nothing. That's okay, right? You don't have to feel anything. Not the slightest spark of warmth or charity. And so again, I breathed the silent prayer, Jesus, I cannot forgive him. And that's true. You can't. Yeah, I read that. I thought, this is beautiful. But he can. Lord, yeah, yeah. Do it through me because I can't. As I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened. Now, if this is true, what I'm reading, it tells me God does not give you the grace until you make the effort. That's it. You've got to make a step. Why would he give you that which you do not need and will not use? You take the step, and then he does it for you. Sister Cole, you want to read the rest? From, no, from the top. From the top. Again, I breathed a silent prayer. Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. As I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder along my arm and through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him, while into my heart sprang a love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed me. And so I discovered that it is not on our forgiveness any more than on our... Now, pause a moment. There was a lady in our program one time. She was terribly wounded by what had been her best friend. And that came out, you know, because we're talking in lectures and everything. Is that a problem? Can a root of bitterness eat you alive? And so I, I told her, what would I tell her? She, you know, this root of bitterness, what would you say? Yeah, yeah you got to forgive her. You got you to, you know, you got to make an effort. You got to forgive her. That's why, you know. And she said, 
you don't know what she did to me. <laughs> I didn't want to know, but she told me. She said, I came into the church, just ladies in the church, two church ladies. She betrayed me one time, two times, and three strikes, yeah. you're out. And she says, you're saying now I need to call her up and this, that, and the other? Seven, seven, seven. Jesus said, right? And I told her, I said, well, yeah. <laughs> she said, no way. Next morning I came in, she's sitting there smiling and beaming. I said, what happened? She said, I called her up. What happened? She said, we're best friends again. <laughs> Somebody's got to make the first move. And by the way, friends, you can never say it was you because 1 John 4, 19, I love him because he first loved me. He came down a long way and made the first move. He does not ask us to do that. He makes the first move, then he says he invites us to make the second move. And so I discovered it is not on our forgiveness anymore than our own. In Luke 6, 35, he is kind to the unthankful. And so I discovered it is not on our forgiveness anymore than on our... Now I go back to where we were. Remember Iran, China, Russia, the answer. It is not on our forgiveness anymore than on our goodness that the world's healing hinges. Ah. But on His. When He tells us to love 635 of Luke, love our enemies, He gives along with the command the love itself. Would that heal the world's problems? Yep. Now, is it going to happen? I don't expect it to happen. Some will. Some will. But that's the answer. That's the answer. You know, um, a brother in the church called me four or five years ago. Is someone we all know. And they said, by the way, this is a ending out the Beatitudes. This is still the Beatitudes, right? He's still up on the Mount of Blessing. He asked me what this verse meant. What does that mean? Exactly Thank you. I said, that's not what troubled him. It was verse 15. Because if you forgive men uh, their trespasses, your Father will also forgive you. But verse 15, if you don't forgive men, can you finish it? Just common sense it. God's not going to forgive you. And what does that mean? And I said what you said. It means what it says. Dear friends, if you can't forgive, you can't go to heaven. It's a salvation issue. <laughs> oh, no. It's a salvation issue. Your salvation hinges on this. You're telling me if Corey Ten Boom had not forgiven that Nazi that helped all that stuff in the thing, that she couldn't go to heaven? I didn't say that. God said that. If you forgive men their trespasses, but if you, verse 15, if you forgive, if you forgive not men their trespasses, God will not forgive you. And then I can add this on. As a human, from observation of 28 years of being a Christian, the longer you wait, the harder it gets. So what should we do? I'm, I'm trying. I don't always succeed. But if there's a problem, I try to fix it that day. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Now, uh, your, sin, uh, your, 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 your sins, your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins, if it is faced from you, Isaiah 59, verse 2. In communion service, are we supposed to make things right? Yeah, that's one reason. That's why it's four, right? He's trying to make things right. You don't have to wait until that time. Because... Yeah. yeah. Now, I, I've had my challenges on this subject. One time I was walking into the church in Waynesboro, it was years ago, and the Lord spoke to my heart. He said, you need to wash that man's feet. And I said to God, I've got nothing against that brother. And God said to me, then why won't you wash his feet? <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, Bible, John 13, verse 4. He took a towel and girded himself. Whose feet did he wash? That son of the devil. It might not have been too hard to wash John, but you get to Judas, it might be tough. I don't know. I, you know, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord is the Lord. I don't know. I, I, I'm not trying to pretend to go down to the Lord's mind. 
but it probably was not easy. I know because in the garden he kept praying, what let this cup pass from me? It wasn't easy to be crucified. Now here's the danger. When, uh, if I've done you wrong and you forgive me, now let me change it. <laughs> if, you, if you've done me wrong and I forgive you, and nobody's done me wrong here, nobody. Nobody's done, I, I don't think anybody's hardly ever done me wrong, but I've done 10,000 people wrong. But if somebody had done me wrong, and I forgive you, when I say I forgive you, did I just bury that sin in the ocean? So six months from now, I can't what? Sister Leah, you want to read Corey Ten Boom's book? God takes our sins, the past, present, and future, and dumps them in the sea and puts up a sign that says no fishing allowed. My dear friends, that is a fish you do not want to catch. John 8, 11, uh, John 8, 11, go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. And that, 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 that sin of prostitution was buried in the sea. That woman was a prostitute no more. The lady, that, that, our, that uh, ah, beautiful testimony on her website, that lady that had such a heroin problem, and it's a, the graphic thing. When she sent it to me, she emailed it to me. She went home, wrote the thing. And Darlene read it, and I said, Darlene, this is graphic. And he's talking about, you know, uh, if you haven't read it, it's graphic. Darlene said, don't change the word of it. I put the whole thing on there, except I called her. By the way, she's coming next week. She's going to be here for that last weekend. Her name is Kayla. And uh, I said, Kayla, I said, uh, I, want to, I want you to change one thing. First sentence, she said, I am a heroin addict. I said, that is not true. That was buried in the, yeah, that's a thousand miles away. God will never pull that one back up. You can say I'm now a child of God or whatever. But even, even so, I'm a recovered, I'm a recovered uh, child rapist. It kind of has a, has a bad flavor to it, doesn't it? <laughs> but I'm a child of God, saved by grace, washed in the blood. That sounds different. You know. Don't be, you know, if, if you have a label that reminds you of what you did, if, if you need reminded, that's okay. Let the Holy Ghost do it. Right? Every now and then I see something, the Holy Ghost reminds me, that was the pit I pulled you out of. Let the Lord re remind you when He needs to. But, uh, you, know, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's all grace. Priority list. We back to the Beatitudes? Yeah. Because that's what we're studying this morning, if you haven't noticed by now. The Beatitudes is the priority list. Does it include forgiveness? Yes. Six, Jesus focuses in on it, but it's in 5 too. Chapter 5 also. So I've got a problem with somebody, Bubba, over here. I've got a problem with Bubba. I'm going to go to church this Sabbath, right? Coming into the house of God. Maybe I'll pray while I'm there. And the door, the Lord slams the door in my face. What does He say? Who read verse twenty-three? Sister Barbara, twenty-three. If you bring a gift to the altar and remember that your brother has something against you. Yeah, yeah. Now pause. You leave that gift here and do what? And then you come back and then you start praying. <laughs> then you come back and bring that offering, brother Oliver. You want to read verse twenty-four? Leave your gift at the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer to me. Well, wait a minute. He doesn't deserve it. You didn't deserve it, neither did you. Neither did you. This is the answer for the three great objections that Christians make. How do I know these are the three great objections? Because these are the one I, I make. <laughs> he doesn't deserve it. Neither do you. Ephesians 2 8, it's grace. Grace is what you don't deserve. Number two, it's all their fault. Mm. I know these by heart. It's all their fault. And God says, He says it does not matter whose fault it is. It doesn't matter. It may be their fault. It may not. Your work is the same. Reconciliation. Number three, they ought to go first. And God says, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, friends. This is how it is. You ought to go first. And Ryan, you can read this one since uh, you already read it once. <laughs> Lord, how oh, shall I shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times. Now pause just a second. If God limited you to seven fallings, failings, how many of you'd be saved? <laughs> <laughs> 
I think I would make it through a day. Come on, in 24, 16 of Proverbs, a just man falls seven times, but that's not all she wrote, right? He gets up and keeps going. Now, verse uh, 22. I say unto thee, I say unto thee, <laughs> big difference, right? I say not unto thee, until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Now, the, the reason this is so hard, and again, as you're older, you're younger, as you get older, you, get, you learn something you don't get when you're young. That when somebody hurts you, let's take uh, any, you know, something really painful, uh, adultery. Adultery, is, is that a painful thing? Okay. Adultery is painful. Can a woman forgive her husband for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, right? Is that right? Can God make it right? Yeah, yeah okay. That's once. Now, he does it, he does it again. Mercy. Can she forgive him a second time? She can, but it will be harder. That's what I was going to ask next. Is it harder the second time? <laughs> yes. Why? Easy. That's Hebrews 6.6. 6. You re-crucify re re the Lord afresh. Mm -hmm. Dear friends, the second time is harder than the first. Why? Easy. Because a woman would say, look, or a man would say, however you look at it, vice versa, the woman would say, you saw how it broke my heart when you did it the first time, and I forgave you. You saw it killed me. And I gave you my, I gave you back my heart. And now you did it again. And so she forgives him again. Mm -hmm. Does it get more difficult? Mm -hmm. Your friends, yeah. 70 times seven. Now there is a condition. Mm -hmm. What's the condition? First John 1, 9, if we confess. Is there some confess, confession, there are repentance and sorrow for sin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, can't, you don't get forgiven unless you confess. Confession includes you're sorry you did, you know, that, that, that. But if you come back seven times, I know this is hard for some people. Somebody's thinking, hmm, that's not right. Oh, God's always right. <laughs> if, God's, if God's right and you don't agree with Him, then you're wrong. Romans 3, verse 4, let God be true and every man a liar. So, yeah, if there's, if there's really heartfelt repentance and you say, how, after how many times can you still have that kind of repentance? I don't know. Mark 16, 9, out of whom He cast seven devils. Evidently, Mary was able to, you know, can you still, is it possible to be sor have sorrow for sin after, a, after an extended period of, of a five star sinning? Mm -hmm. Ask King David. Mm -hmm. Dead in trespass and sin. Ye who were once dead in trespass and sin, he has what? Ephesians 2 verse 1. Yeah. Whew. Is this hard? Mm -hmm. Yes. In order to work this kind of plan, do you need divine patience? Let me tell you one of the best verses in the Bible, right there. I read that thing for 20 years and didn't understand it. I'm not saying I got it all now, but I got something. Sister Leah, you want to read? Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. Read it again slower. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I, will, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. God's word expresses his patience. Is he a patient God? He'd have to be. Or I'd be, I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd be lost. He's a patient God. Now, I gave you homework yesterday. I'm going to ask you if you did it. Did anybody do their homework? Okay. All right. Here, everybody. everybody did it. That means nobody had a pity party yesterday, right? <laughs> Let me see, did I do my homework? Uh, no comment. <laughs> Amazing Grace, page 360. We like to say God is a God of relationships. 1 John 3, 2. Uh, 1 John 3, 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we shall be called, that we shall be called the what? Sons, Sons and daughters of God. Sons of God. Now, I had daughters in. Now, but that didn't, that, no, no, you missed it if you don't have verse 2. No, no. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. The first is relationships. Verse 2, it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But when he shall appear, we shall be just like what? Him, that's a relationship. Now, is it going to be better in heaven between us two than it is now on earth? Will it be better in heaven than it is here? Will you have a, a relationship in heaven that you... Don't have here. Yeah, I've Yeah. First John three two. It doth not yet 
appear what we shall be. But when he doth comes, when he appears, then we shall be like him. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. Will there be a closeness in fellowship in heaven that may exceed what we have here? What will be missing in heaven that we have here? Sin. Sin. Carnal nature. And the final restitution. Brother uh, Sean, this one's for you and me. But in the final restitution, when there shall be a new heaven and a new earth, it, which is the Garden of Eden, Eden is to be restored more gloriously adorned than at the beginning. Does that include, is that just the trees or does that include the friendships? Friends, everything. Uh, everything. Package deal. Miss Nicole. It was Satan's purpose to bring about an eternal separation between God and man. But in Christ we become more closely united to God than if we had never fallen. In order. Ah, you see? There's it. There it is. Never fallen. Yeah. Yeah. You're closer to Christ after the fall than you were before. Oh, I'm glad we failed. You missed no, it. Didn't. You missed it. If you say that, then you're glad he hung on the cross. Mm -hmm. My dear friends... Yeah, yeah, no. I'm sorry he went through all that mess, but I'm glad for the result. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, if this is true, Satan's purpose is to separate me from God forever. But in Christ, we become more closely united to God than if we had never fallen. In order to have this kind of relationship, what must you do? Forgive. Forgive. Can you be closer? after sin than you were before? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. But you have to forgive. When you forgive somebody, if they wronged you, is that an outright five-star demonstration of God's, oh, yes. God's grace. grace? Because you do not deserve it. And He gave it to you. Now, here's Just like you said yesterday, you know, um, when you recognize in yourself that you don't deserve it either. Amen. You are able to then extend that sympathy hmm. to someone else. Yeah. 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 Because once or you put yourself should be able on to. this yeah. hell so where you think that you deserve things, it's hard to forgive other people. Yeah. yeah. So I'll give you your homework. Three minutes in your homework assignment. This is a... There's no, I mean, this is something, it's Friday, right? Sabbath's coming. This is one you need, you probably, if, if you want to, <laughs> it's your choice. My mother remarried, and again, this is, this was, uh, yeah. my mother remarried. I, I was out of the house. I was grown. Father died. I was gone. My mother remarried, remarried a man named Alvin. My mother's dead. He's long dead. So I use his name. And that man, I, I was, as I met him, I was an atheist. Okay, I was, this was my days before Christian. That man irritated me to no end. He had a book. If you did him wrong, he'd write it down in his book. No, no, no. And then remind you of it. One time, he had this old station wagon. And he was trying to sell it. And I said, uh, what do you want for it? He said, what would you give me? I said, come on out. What do you want for it? What will you give me? And I said, some low price. And I paid him for it, and I took it. He said, you robbed me. Later, he said, you robbed me of my station wagon. And then, anyway, it was just, oh, he made my blood boil. He made my blood boil, then became a Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> Went back to visit my mom. Alvin made my blood boil. <laughs> and I knew it wasn't right. I knew it wasn't right. Ah. And I said, Lord, I hate the guy. <laughs> then I read 635 of Luke. <laughs> I, I, I hate the guy. I'd go back. I remember I'd, I'd, I'd get all prayed up and go there. He'd say something. I couldn't stand the sight of him. <laughs> and then uh, I, knew I, had, I knew something had to change. And God helped me. And I prayed real hard. I said, Lord, i got to go back. and i gotta, I got to change this thing. So I went back. By the way, once I became a Seventh-day Adventist, what we did, we played cards. It was like Uno. It wasn't poker or something. We were playing cards. After I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I began to play cards with Alvin. And instead of beating him and having joy in it, I let him beat me. <laughs> but he knew I was letting him beat me. I did it just to spite him. And now I'm seven, I'm a, seven, day, seven day Adventist. Seven day Adventist. Yeah. 
I, I knew something had to change. And then God gave it to me. This is your homework assignment, and what God did for me, He'll do for you. I went into uh, my mom's house. I mean, I had, I had never prayed so hard in my life. And as the, the, the visit transpired, I just felt this hatred, come, this, this mean, spirited, angry, ugh, ugh. I was getting ready to leave. I said, Lord, help me at least turn around, smile, say goodbye in a warm way. I turned around with a snarl on my face. I said, Alvin, in a snarling kind of, and God gave it to me. As I looked at Alvin, as I looked at him, to my, forcibly to my mind was brought back, Alvin had said something to me years before. He said, when I was in like the fourth or fifth grade, when I was a child, we were so poor, I'd wear my mother's shoes to school. Can children be very cruel? And when God looks at Alvin, he doesn't see Alvin. He sees every experience, every twisting and, and, and crisis and bending that made Alvin what he is today. He understands all the circumstances that turned that man into this sour whatever. God sees more than that. He sees Alvin today and what caused it, and he sees what? By God's grace, what is possible. And the Lord spoke to me, and all he said, all you see is what you see. We had, we had somebody here one time. I really could hardly, they were very irritating to me. I said, Lord, this is a long time after Alvin. And as the days passed, I asked the Lord, give me a love for this person. And he did. He gave it to me. But then that wasn't the hard part. And then the Lord said, um, Alvin needs to see me. I see him. He needs to see me. And the Lord said, well, I'm not down there in Alvin's house. But what? You are. You are. <laughs> now, when he sees you, he needs to see me. And so when Alvin gives you bitterness and anger and he needs to receive what in return? Love. I said, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> have mercy. So now you love that man. Ye are my witnesses that I am God. Psalms 43, I think it's verse 12. Ye are my witnesses. It's hard. Now your homework. You got an Alvin in your life, you need to make it right by dark. By the way, every single case, an impression of the Holy Ghost, if not acted upon, what happens to it? It always, it always weakens. God gives the impression, need to act, or you lose it. Uh, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. I'll call thee when I have a more convenient time. No, no, they lost it. You got to act. Now, you do not have to pray this one out. You don't need to strain and grunt and groan and have smoke coming out of ears for five hours. If there's an album in your life, oh, you know it right offhand. You don't have to think about it. I got, <laughs> now, if there are, well, somebody might say, well, there are five in my life. Come on, you start with one, then go to number two. You don't get it all today? Today, tomorrow's a new day. And then a lady told me, the lady... That, that had all the problems. Remember that lady that said that my, my friend betrayed me three times, three strikes you're out? She said, what if I call her up and she spits in my face? Easy answer, you did your part. That's all your part is. You call them up, they spit in your face, you did your part. Jesus did his part, they spit in his face. That's okay, he did his part. Are you doing your part? Your part is gotta go first. They don't deserve it, neither do you. Well, it's all their fault. It does not matter whose fault there is. That's God's plan for reconciliation. And it begins as soon as you take ask her action. That's Cory Tim Boom, died a happy lady. Right. <laughs> she had learned the hard way to forgive, I'll pray. Our Father in heaven, as we take up our homework assignment today, whew, for some folks in the room, it might be a challenge, perhaps for all. But help us to be faithful. If this is true, if this is a salvation issue, if you're waiting upon us to take action, if this will heal the wounds of the world, then God help us to be active and about our Father's business today. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.